Welcome to The Rant. I'm Corey Morgan. This is my weekly live show. So, comments are welcome. I'm having internet issues tonight, so I'm sure they'll dog us as we go through my cursing. One of the things I'll bitch about quickly is rural internet challenges. I have some difficulty with it out here. Hopefully we get a good live stream, though. I got a lot of things to go on and rant about this week. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll let you know what I think about you. I'll also let you know what to think about the news, and I'll offer at the end of this the coveted Chode of the Week award. We got a good winner this week. He certainly earned it. So, getting on, I should start, though, with a Chode who hasn't won the award this week, but he's worthy of it. Yes, of course, Justin Trudeau, as usual, being himself. He's done a couple of beautiful things this week. Uh, as, aside from just being his usual hammerhead self. One of which, though, I see there's an ad. So if you're looking for a job in these hard economic times, here we go. They're looking for a storyteller. This is like an eighty-six dollars to $100,000 a year job in the Prime Minister's office as a storyteller and team lead. Uh, I don't know if you lead a team of storytellers or how this is all supposed to come together and work, but for a six-figure job, which I imagine comes with full benefits and everything, and who are you telling these stories to? Justin, does he need somebody to read the pop-up books to him before he goes to bed at night or something? This is governments that are always saying they got no room to uh, save money. They're, they're as lean as they can get. There's, there's no way they can cut the budget. But Justin can hire a personal storyteller. That's rather telling on, on how responsibly they're, they're, they're looking at our money right now. But on beyond that, so our means to make money, something we celebrated a lot was this uh, announcement from Trump that he was supporting that concept of the Alaska to Alberta Railway. I mean, this, is, this was fantastic. This could be something that Alberta could, and the whole West could ship goods, whether it's potash or grain, lumber, coal, you name it, to the coast, up to Alaska, to a deep water port and access uh, uh, markets in Asia, Russia, India, all the way across that ocean there. It's fantastic. It would have been great for economic development. Good for tourism, maybe. They could do a passenger train up there. Who, who doesn't want to see Alaska? I mean, it'd be a beautiful route. And uh, it, it looked like this thing might be coming along. Well, Trudeau decided to open his big mouth. Said, no, no, you might not want to put money into this right now because it might not pass uh, the, the, the requirements in C69, which is the pipeline killing bill for those not familiar with it. Just in saying that, he pretty much killed this project. They need to raise billions of dollars to get this railway through. And with our example of Canada uh, of screwing investors when they try to get a project going and follow the rules, nobody in their right mind is going to put a nickel into this thing. When, when Trudeau's already saying that it might not pass his special C69, it might not have, what, enough gender parity and equity in, in the planning or might not be able to account for how that potash is used downstream when it gets across the ocean. That railway unless he comes out right and says he's going to support it and he says that it's going to pass this assessment, it's dead. It's dead. So put that dream aside. The West is not allowed to diversify its economy. It's not allowed to diversify its markets without Central Canada's permission and it looks like Trudeau does not want to give it. So getting stateside though, I suffered through, and I'll say suffered, the debate. Uh, the American presidential debate. And that was horrible. Uh, an hour and a half of my life that I will not get back. I will not be talked into watching the next two debates. But I'm going to play a bit of a mashup of that debate for you, just so you can get a feel of how it was. Somebody put this together. Have a listen. Everybody knows he's a liar. It's a disaster. He just pours gasoline in the fire. It's a disaster. If we get the votes, it's going to be all over. He's going to go. He can't stay in power. You should get out of your bunker. The president has no plan. This man, this man, he does not have a plan. The president has no plan. He doesn't have a plan. He still doesn't have a plan. Would you Who shut up, man? Listen. California's burning. California's burning. We closed it down and now we're reopening. California's burning. California's burning. And this is all about trying to dissuade people from voting. California's burning. California's burning. Thousand people there. All right, that's enough of that. Either way, what it was was a crazy old man yelling insults at a man who had dementia uh, being moderated by another older man who felt like intervening and interrupting all the time, though they were all interrupting. It was just a, a gong show. There was no good policy debates. I feel for Americans who have to try and choose between those two people for their president. This is the most powerful country in the nation in the world. It's got, what, 350, 400 million people, whatever it is, and those are the best two you guys could come up with? I mean, it, it's just, it was too much. I mean, I like how Trump shakes things up. I like the memes. I like how he entertains me, but 
oh my my lord that, that was just awful it was an insult fest i mean you went after the other guy's kids and, and it just just no you know do better you guys please because because we gotta live next door to you and uh i i just gotta hope for something more down there so let's get to our domestic politicians though we we've had one step in it everybody a, a knows he's, in, uh, it's a just... he's an mla up in uh, lac saint anne uh his name is eluding me right at the moment but he was caught on a video that the ndp shared where he said some Serb recipients are sitting around watching cartoons and eating cheesies. Well, it's one way to put it. I mean, when you're doing a town hall, you're talking to people, you use analogies and things like that. And cheesies are Canadian, so it's not that uh, harmful. But here, here it is, the video that the NDP released, their scandal of the week, you know, since they, they didn't have all the kids, students dying they were hoping for. So uh, let's have a look and see what he had to say here. They can't hire people. And I'm going, well, why not? Well, because they make more on Serb, eating cheesies and watching cartoons, I guess. You had calls from my friend John out in, in uh, Vernon. The same thing. They have drug addiction issues. So people that were getting $700 a month, now we're getting $2,000 a month. We're concerned about the same thing here because now all of a sudden you've got that population that has all this extra cash, and now their addiction levels are going through the roof. And then what? The funny money runs out? Yeah. So really, is this worth lighting their hair on fire? Of course, they're demanding apologies, resignations, usual crap. Uh, hopefully, uh, Premier Kenny ignores him, as, as does uh, Mr. Getz in there. But the point he's hitting on, and he didn't say it, and pretty much nobody's saying it, not everybody on CERB is a lazy bum who's taking advantage of it. In fact, the vast majority are people who got hooked. The government shut down their lines of work. They had to do something to get these people to make their rent, to uh, pay their mortgages, their, their put food on their table, literally. So yes, there had to be a program with no questions asked to get money in people's hands. We could question whether or not we had to shut down in the first place. That's a separate discussion. But let's not pretend either that there's a segment of the population that's going to take advantage of it. I mean, come on, we know them. I, I'm going to give one of my past stories. because I, I had a period of time right at the start of my 20s. I needed a place to live. I was between relationships. Suddenly, you know, sort of suitcase sort of situation. People say, well, Alex is looking for a roommate. Oh, boy. So he had a place he was renting right in Forest Lawn in an area full of fourplexes. And, and what a five months that was. But it was an eye-opener. So as a, a 20, 21-year-old for those five months... It was a party in there every night because Alex personified the kind of person who would take advantage of things like Serb. He knew every program, every in and out, every minimal amount of work to get a little bit of money. He liked holding the parties because that way he could drink every night because people would bring booze and he'll drink the excess. And then on the big night that when there was enough empties, you know, once a month to take him in, he'd buy his own booze for a night. It was, and I got to meet the neighbors. So, you know, the, the single mom next door with three kids from three dads who was always making it clear she's taking applications for the fourth father other individuals from all over the place. I mean, there's a subclass of people. You know, we call them white trash. They're not always white. Things like that. And we can't deny that they're there. We can't deny that these people will take advantage of these programs. They will sit on the couch and smoke weed, watch cartoons, and eat cheesies. You haven't been out very much. Perhaps you've lived a coddled enough life that you've never actually encountered people like this. Well, they exist. And they're out there. And we do have to put controls into programs to stop these people from taking full advantage of them all the time. I, I mean, we're running out of money. This pandemic has knocked us down. You go to Walmart, we'll see them. They aren't starving to death. And uh, they, well, just, you know them when you see them. These are special sorts of folks. And again, I mean, we, we have this politically correct thing. Where we're supposed to pretend, man, that's a set, isn't it? Pretend that these people aren't out there. We can't. We can't. I know it seems insensitive, but we've got to filter the bums out. Because there are bums. There are lazy people. They actually don't. It seems inconceivable. They have no ambition. They have no vision for the future. They, they don't want to go anywhere. And if you give them a program, they're going to get on it. And, you know, we, we've made parodies of them with, with Trailer Park Boys again. But the reason it was funny is because everybody could laugh because they could see they've known people like that. They've seen things like that. Again, it's not saying every person in a, in a mobile home park is a bum. But mobile home parks have a hell of a lot of bums at them. And it's one scheme and scam after another to take advantage of these things. And down stateside, shameless. I recommend that to anybody who likes uh, kind of a dark, uh, twisted humor. Frank, the main character on there, oh yeah, he would have loved Serb. He probably would have created five different identities and collected on all five and then, of course, just vanished when, uh, whenever we come to try and pick up the bill. So either way, as we go through this, we've got to have discussions. Perhaps we don't have to be as insensitive as to talk about cheesies and cartoons, but I will because I'm not a sensitive guy. But there are people who are going to take advantage of this program and they should not be shouted down or told to resign because they've pointed out the people who will. Now, an incident that happened this week. So a young fella, Mr. Dodging Horse. We had the, the Calgary Ring Road got completed. There was the big ceremonial opening. All our politicians came out, the big ribbon cutting. 
there was Ninchi, there was Jason Kenny, uh, even Kent Hare because he was an MP. I mean, because this thing was in the works for so long, and they were, you know, and the chief of the the Sutina Reserve, and they were all going to pat themselves on the back over this great project that just got completed. And this young fella comes up, takes the microphone, and gives a little story about how it displaced his mother from her home, and and he was disgusted with the whole affair. And he cut off his braids and threw them on the road, in protest and disgust. It was a great protest. It caught the eyes of the whole country. And, uh, you know, it really stole the show from all of those politicians who were standing there. So, you know, good work, kid, as, as far as that's concerned. But then, of course, the usual haywire suspects who don't know a thing about what's going on, what's happened there, what's happening on reserves in general, start speaking up and, and the bullshit starts coming out. And that's when I get annoyed. So, you know, here comes some of the tweets from these people. Like, here's one. This is so sad. They took his homeland without permission, without any amends. He thanked because they allowed him to speak on his home violation. Okay, they didn't take his homeland. And they didn't do it without permission, and they didn't do it without amends. So people not familiar with the Ring Road Project, this thing was in the works for 70 years. 70 years they've been talking about this thing. This went back and forth, every kind of a negotiation imaginable. And they put it to the entire band, democratically, in a referendum. Two referendums, actually. So the first deal that they offered them, the band members looked and said, no, it's not good enough. And they said, take it, uh, we won't do it. Fair enough. So then the road was put on hold again. We, the government had to come up with new offers, new uh, concessions, and they made another offer. Well, that offer was accepted by over 80% of the band members in a vote. It was well discussed. Oh boy, there was consultation. 70 years worth, and particularly in that last five years. So every band member, each and every one of them, got $61,000 cash in hand in their pocket, right off the bat. The band also got a multi-hundred million dollar trust fund that would pay off for them for a long time. They got, uh, for uh, 400 hectares of land for this uh, road, they got 14 or 1500 new hectares of land just on the west side over by Brad Creek. I rest assured, they got a really good drill. Triple the amount of land back that was used in the first place. And they still have access to all that land as well. Some homes were moved. That's life, you know, they get expropriated whether you're on native land or not. And there's $65 million set aside just to move those homes and move this. So his mom wasn't left homeless. She was just moved to a new home, which, to be honest, was newer and probably better than the last one. So, you know, but these people speaking up, they look at the, the image of the kid cutting off his braids and they go back to that, oh, we, we took their homeland. Well, no, that, that's not the case at all. And, of course, it set off the bullshit meter. You know, please, we got some sensitive issues, but let's stay out of the outright bullshit because there's way too much when it comes to uh, First Nations and the troubles they're going through and the troubles we're, we're all going through and trying to figure out how to cope with it. A further tweet, and I mean, these are all in response to another guy's tweet who had something like 97,000 likes on it. Like, it, this thing went viral. And this guy says, the migratory paths of animals are cut off and forms a barrier-like wall and eliminates biodiversity and leads to extinctions. Wow! And then comes the gas stations, convenience stores, malls. Well, again, that's bullshit. This is an 11 kilometer road. It's on the boundary of the city of Calgary. Nothing was migrating through there. I mean, people were migrating through to go to the 7-Eleven or Superstore and then back to their homes. The, the animals have long left that area. It, it, but again, that doesn't stop somebody from tweeting that out. And the person doesn't know the road, doesn't know the area, thinks, oh my God, they've cut off this migratory path in the middle of a native reserve and didn't compensate anybody and they're gonna make things extinct. And, Oh, wow, it just goes unchecked. So, you know, I'm not going to let it go unchecked. I'm going to go on and I'm going to rant about this and I'm going to call these people out on this sort of thing. And then this guy, how, sad how settlers, colonizers are still oppressing natives who have a right to the land. Well, it's still their land, you dumb asshole. And I'm not a settler. And my grandparents were born here. My parents were born here. I was born here. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to get on a back, back on a boat and go home? And, you know, that's some of the attitude they talk about. We're settlers and you should go home. Why... Is that acceptable in this context? It sure as hell isn't when it comes to any racial minority who's recently immigrated here. And it shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be acceptable for you pricks to call us settlers when we've been born and raised here. That's a load of crap and I'm getting tired of that attitude while we're at it. And then this one. Oh, he's going to apologize on his behalf of his country or her or whatever the hell this person is. They didn't deserve this. Nobody deserves this. Breaks your heart for this. I deeply apologize. Kiss my ass. Do not apologize on my behalf. If I'm sorry about something, I'll say sorry, but you don't apologize for me, because I'm not sorry. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't displace anybody. Don't speak for me. And you certainly don't. And here's another one, and this is where we get to the loaded words. This is where we get to the, the deeper bullshit. And, and, and Trudeau used this word when talking about Aboriginal things too. Colonizing and genocide. They're using the term genocide. That's infuriating. The world, the modern world, has seen genocide. 
and it's not what's been happening with First Nations in Canada. Not even close. So let's have some pictures to remind people what genocide really looks like. This is genocide, you guys. Millions of people slaughtered, buried in mass pits. That's genocide. This is another picture of that genocide. Forests full of bodies, people executed, slaughtered. What did we do? We gave them a casino on a road. That's not genocide. In Rwanda, same thing. Slaughter of people, trying to wipe them out literally through murder, not through a residential school system. And by the way, residential schools didn't look like this. This is what genocide looks like, you guys. And in First Nations, there's concerns, but genocide isn't the word for it. I do want to talk about the reserve problem, though, because that's what gets me with these people, too. They're usually urban dwellers. They've never actually been to a reserve. Uh, maybe they've gone to a powwow once, you know, and got to see some entertainment. That's great. It's a fun time. You meet some people. I spent 20 years in the oil field. I spent time on isolated reserves all over the place. I watched them decline in quality of life, and they weren't that good to begin with. Because you've got an isolated population of people with no industry, nothing going on. What are you expecting to happen? Like, that, this is what stumps me with these people. What's your end game? What do you want to see? Because you, you oppose that. That's one of the things with this ring road. They're opposing, oh, it's going to give more access in, into the reserve and it's going to cause bad things to happen. Well, so you want them cut off from the modern world? You don't want them to have access to it? Shopping, jobs, education? Because that's the only thing that's going to pull them out of the rut that they're in. Right now, particularly in isolated reserves, there are no job opportunities. There's nothing up there. If the resources aren't being developed right nearby, the only employer tends to be the native band itself, which usually means you're only going to get a job if you've got a good relationship with the chief and his or her family. And you just get the rest of the socioeconomic disaster following. And that's what we got on reserves on every level. The reserve system has failed. It's failed. And it's failing and it's going to continue to fail. And we got to start openly talking about that and looking for solutions to getting out because we can't fix this. Putting more money in to keep people racially segregated, and that's what it is. It's apartheid. We couldn't accept it in South Africa, yet we accept it in Canada. So here's some pictures from housing. People, again, are always horrified. Oh my God, look at the houses they're living in. Yeah, but those houses were built. They were ruined. And again, it's because they are unfortunately socially dysfunctional people and they don't own those houses. Uh, the person except uh, upset actually about Mr. Dodging Horse losing uh, his mother losing her house welcomed a socialized housing because the reserve owns all the houses. So the only one who could kick her out of her house in the location it was in was the band itself because you don't own them. So no, of course they don't improve their homes or fix them up because you could lose your home at the whim of the chief and council and it's of no value to you. You can't sell it. It's not an asset. Uh, it, it's just something you live in that was given to you, uh, good or bad. So, of course, it goes into disrepair. There, there's no reason to fix it up. So property rights has been one of the things long talked about as a way to work towards getting people off those reserves, build some assets, build some equity. But right now, this system does not allow that. And now, here's their income levels. You know, 80% of the reserves have a median income below the poverty line, below it. And then those who are making income, again, for the most part, are social services, or working for government in one way or another. Is, is this working? Because this is getting worse every year too. And that's why I keep asking the end game. Because do you really, how do you see with these isolated reserves 30 years from now, this getting any better? Do, do you see them suddenly just saying, we're gonna stop abusing substances, we're all gonna be happy to just live in these social houses and, and collect social services and not work for a living? It just doesn't work guys. And and they're not, you know, living in some traditional little thing. I think there's there's some Toronto and downtown Calgary people even who think that they, they live an old native lifestyle. I mean, yeah, they practice a lot of great traditional things, but at the same time, they're in the modern world. They've got satellite dishes, TV, snowmobiles, trucks, heat. They like that, and they should. But it's it's not enough. Here's their average lifespan, 15 years less than other Canadians. I mean, they're dying. That's, what? 18% of the average life lost if you're a native in Canada, basically, on chances are you're going to die early. This is not winning and it's not getting better. That's what I got to keep driving home. It's not getting better. And it's heavy drinking, of course. Here's the numbers, the dark blue on the left, the light blue on the right, natives versus non-natives, drinking, and of course other drugs and substance abuse. But what do you expect with people who are stuck sitting on these spots? I mean, they don't feel a sense of pu pu purpose. They don't feel a future. It's depressing. And this has nothing to do with race. There's the thing. I'm sure somebody's going to come out and say I'm a racist. Look, if you took any race and you stick them aside from everyone else and, and have them grow up in this dependent state on, these on an isolated reserve like that, you're going to be messed up. 
It doesn't matter what race you are. So, no, if you really hate natives, you'll want them to stay on these reserves because this is the worst possible thing you could do is keep them up there. And look at all these numbers. How long are we going to ignore these things? Uh, this is the educational attainment, you know, because if you're, if you're hoping that to get off and uh, some higher education is certainly a better way to get about it, especially if you're going to try perhaps for a virtual economy or something else. But I mean, 48%... Uh, of the natives right now aren't even completing high school university degrees you know it's it's uh it's just not in the cards education's failing uh, every measure you know the homicide rates so crime because again they're living miserably uh, look at how more likely a native is to be murdered than a non-native i mean we got the mi missing women's and, and aboriginal tribunal yes there's something there, but it's not some systemic racism. It's not some conspiracy of white guys out there stealing women and killing them and burying them in the woods or something. I mean, some of that happened with that lunatic Picton. Uh, but they are vulnerable people, the, the, the native women. I mean, if they leave the reserve, unfortunately, they're also very dysfunctional. I'm not talking about just kicking people off and dumping them in the city. We, we, we see those people quite often homeless too. They aren't prepared for that world either. Like, we've really got to look seriously at getting these people off these reserves and transitioning them to a non-reserve life because they aren't winning guys they aren't i mean they should have some land let's break it up give them assets but uh no and yes you know so S susan susie sue is uh, speaking up yes it's hired many people of different ethnicities with no more expectations than a competency to do the job of course and that's how most people are despite everybody uh, acting as if canada is some giant racist cesspool it's not i mean we're a very tolerant nation and we're we're killing these guys with i think uh, what some people feel is kindness and again i think it should be almost mandatory for everybody to go out and visit a reserve in person. See the wild dogs. See the houses falling apart. Uh, see the people passed out in the street. See the kids running around barefoot. Because they really do. You feel like you're in a third world country. Go to standoff in midsummer. You'd think you're in, in somewhere in central Mexico. It's dusty, dirty, and, and it's, it's just horrific. Uh, and again, these people, are, uh, that's the thing too. So this is showing that who gets accused of the homicides. Because again, it's not some conspiracy of non-Aboriginals killing Native people. They're killing each other. And it's because they're in a huge socially dysfunctional mess of a state. Which is going to continue as long as we have a reserve system going. And this is the, the I don't know what happened with that little flat line for a few years there. But this is the incarceration trends for natives. And again, people keep speaking, oh, that's because of the, the racist system is over, you know, over-representation in jail. Well, no, it's because they're committing all the bloody crimes. And we've got to get lower into this issue, deeper into this issue, and find out why. Why are they so dysfunctional that they are so prone and inclined to get into trouble with crimes? Because you can't just not sentence them because they do commit more crimes and it becomes more dangerous. There is a justice system for a reason. So let's look deeper. This is Davis Inlet. I mean, here's a great example for those of us who can date myself a bit. Remember the 90s. That was uh, up on Labrador there. These were an Inuit population. And the whole world was horrified when, when an expose showed the housing conditions they were living in up there. And kids were huffing gasoline out of bags. It was awful. And they saw just how deplorable the conditions were for all those people up in this isolated area of the coastline. So what are we going to do? This is awful. So we spent, I believe it was like a, a couple hundred thousand an individual, but they actually picked up the entire town and they moved it like 20 kilometers down the coast. They moved every one of them, said, we can't even fix this town. We just got to rebuild it and start from scratch with new housing, new programs and all of that. Well, when you follow up, it's the same thing. There's garbage everywhere. The kids are still huffing gas. Uh, you know, there's wild dogs. There's high suicide rates. It, it's awful. It's misery because the problem isn't whether it's new housing or, or things like that they've just got nothing to do you've stuck them there what are you anticipating happening really i mean it's it's just awful and and, and they're having a lot of kids so this is going to be growing and growing it so we've got to start looking at next in plan guys and and shutting people down in the bullshit we see when when whenever some native speaks up like like young mr dodging horse well let's respond to mr dodging horse with facts not a bunch of oh we're calling us settlers and bullshit and apologizing on my behalf because no that's not productive it's not getting us anywhere and it's only hurting people like him actually in the end either way i'll get on to something uh the chode of the week a worthy winner this time it's old gil mcgowan gil gil's a real special sort of fella not terribly bright to be honest but somehow he did get himself to the to head the Alberta Federation of Labor, which is, uh, this is a group by, so the, it's a labor group, it represents a whole bunch of unions, but people have got to keep in mind that that union is, or that, that group is actually a branch of the provincial NDP. If you read the provincial NDP constitution, it is mandatory for members of the Alberta Federation of Labor to be on their party executive. Those two organizations are integrated. So whenever Gill pulls off some crap, Notley has to wear that too. 
because they are of the same group. They are linked. And what did old Gil do this time? I mean, he, he usually does, you know, stupid stunts of, uh, uh, you know, just soft speaking or supporting union thuggery and that sort of thing. And I guess this is a sense of it. What the Alberta Federation of Labor did was built a website with pro UCP businesses, the businesses they determined were supportive of the UCP and listed them all with their addresses and just talked about you should boycott them. And of course, that's the usual union thuggery way too. They're just also saying perhaps, you know, read into it. We just want you to boycott them. If a brick flies through a window, you know, well, shit happens, I guess, you know, or if somebody gets hassled coming out the door or, or things like that. Because some of these businesses that are in that list, and I'm not going to give the link to it even if you really want to look it up, but I don't want to give these guys more credit than they, they need. Uh, they're small, you know, little tailor shops, little outfits. They supported the UCP. That's our right as a, you know, in a democratic society. Some were family farms and they've given the addresses of these places. And Gill's pointing at them. It's just another example of thuggery, bullying, pushing around, saying, if you support that party, we're going to shame you and we're going to try and put you out of business. These businesses employ thousands and thousands of Albertans. You know, they pay billions in taxes. And Gill wants them shut down. He wants them boycotted because they supported a party that wasn't the party that his organization is tied at the hip to. Well, that makes you a chode, Gill. The chode. The chode of the week. You're a prick. You deserve the award. You'll probably get it again. Well, that's enough ranting for this week, so thanks for listening in. I feel better for myself. I don't know if you feel any better. But I will see you next week. This Wednesday as well, we're going to have the, the Western Standard uh, News Roundup around midday. That's not as ranty as this. It'll be much more rationed and reasonable, and uh, we can discuss some issues there. It's also a live thing. And uh, don't forget, if you're seeing this on YouTube, it's not live anymore, but subscribe. You know, we're going to have a lot of productions, a lot of interviews, different things, people coming on. And uh, if you haven't subscribed on Western Standard Online, we are a publication that takes no government money, not a nickel. We don't take any union money either, Gil. Uh, we're independent, and it takes some funds to get independent. So if you want to subscribe, spend a few bucks, or if you want to advertise with us, by whole, all means, get a hold of us. The old mainstream media is fading, and we're filling in for them. So, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on Wednesday.